Most of you know me as Net Poet. Um, I have a law firm in Frankfurt, and uh, every now and then I have, give a seminar on usually copyrights, IT law stuff. Um, but in the past years, we have been dealing with one issue, especially on the demo, or, uh, demo party organizing uh, scene, that's been keeping us busy. Um, and it's, it's coming up again and again. And we wanted to, um, we've been dealing with a few issues, and I wanted to give you a quick insight into what it is that's, that keeps us busy, and what we do about it, and what you can do about it. And uh, how many of you are musicians? Okay, that, uh, yeah, you're an organizer. You, you, okay, yeah, you too. Yeah, I, oh, hey, you're here too. Um, and uh, any GEMA members here? Well, honestly, if I were, I would not admit it either. <laughs> but why is that? What, what, what's all the fuss about? GEMA handling, um, and why, when you deal with GEMA, you ever just, usually everybody struggles, even GEMA. What is it? Um, and I'll give you insights into what I know. This is not something that I do um, professionally often, but it's something that I do hobby-wise, you know, organizing, um, especially German demo parties, so especially like uh, Revision Evoke. Um, sometimes the, a copyright question like that comes up, because usually it deals with copyright, and we'll see what it is. When you have questions, just raise your hand. You'll be given a microphone, um, so you don't delay them and, and forget. Um, I had to pick a few aspects of GEMA handling. I'm sure you will have thousands of them. Um, when we're done, when I'm done with this, I will still be at this party. So address me if there is something you, you think you cannot ask in this, in this audience because it's so far away from what, what we're talking about. Um, I'll be here the next days. You know the drill. So this, <laughs> this is, <laughs> it wasn't even in, uh, intended as a joke. This is one of the images that especially people in Germany see a lot when it comes to YouTube. This is the most obvious phenomenon that we have in Germany about GEMA struggling. We cannot see many of the videos that you see on YouTube, which is peculiar in, in various ways, but we'll come to YouTube later. So what's causing all this? Why is it so difficult? Like, how does this come up? Why why deal with that? I mean, why it's in, in international relations, the, BIEA, um, the uh, BIEM members don't seem to be that much of a hassle. Why GEMA? What, what's all the fuss about? First of all, GEMA is a uh, collecting society, more precisely, and I have to read this because I can never remember it, a society for musical performance and mechanical reproduction rights. The mechanical reproduction rights also comes into play when it, goes to, when it comes to CDs and stuff that's basically, well, as the name says, mechanical reproduction as opposed to pure creativity. What? Sorry, I was just thinking about digital distribution for commercial music like whatever, iTunes, Apple, um, Amazon, MP3, and stuff like that. It's par that's yeah. part of it, too? Obviously, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's obviously not restricted to mechanical distribution, as we're obviously going away from the pure media. Um, just, yeah, yes. Um, and Collecting Society, I will go into that in a, in a minute. And it also, as I said, it is a member of BIEM. I also have to read that because I can never remember it. It's a French um, acronym, but in English, it's the International Organization Representing Mechanical Rights Societies. Now we only have mechanical rights, but for some reason, it's an abbreviation, whatever. Meaning, uh, BIEM is an international um, club, if you so will, of collecting societies, just like GEMA in, in France. It's SASEM. It's, uh, uh, it's Suisse, I think, in Swiss, uh, Switzerland, and you know, tons of stuff like that. If you want um, a, a, a complete list, um, it will be in there. You cannot click right now, but you'll be given the presentation. But you also find it on, on, on Wikipedia. Um, I have linked a few things in here. You'll see that, obviously, in blue. If any of you wants to see that, then I can basically go and click. Um, but when I think it's just interest, uh, interesting for reference, um, I will not click on this. There is a delay on or reverb on this. If you can get what? Yeah, good. Oh, big screen! <laughs> you mean big screen? Woo! <laughs> So 
So what does a collecting society do at all? It collects royalties, obviously. Meaning, um, if you are a member and uh, you create work and you would like to exploit it, but you can't deal with all of that, you become a member of a collecting society that does it for you, obviously uh, commercially. Because they think that members cannot do that themselves. And in a way, at least it used to be true. It's a question whether it's still true. I doubt it for certain areas, but the, like the, the, the traditional offline CD production stuff, what kind, what kind of music, what tracks are played in clubs, that sort of stuff, how, how, do you, how would you ever like, find the people that play your music and go, yeah, I'd like, a, I'd like royalties from you? That's the basic thought. Anyway, now, GEMA's wording on this, and I, I browsed their, I perused their website for quite a while trying to find the material, and it's actually not as easy as I thought it would be. Um, they say, this way, meaning our service, if you become a member of, of our um, association, this way you can devote yourself to creating, knowing that we deal with the righteous licensing of the use um, of your works. So basically, you concentrate on creating, and we do the collecting. Now, if you, will, if you want to become a member, and this is interesting because it, it means a lot, of, like, a lot of consequences come from this. If you become a member, you have to first complete the Aufnahmeantrag, like a membership application, which basically is not really the contract. It's basically just sending them all your data, like who you are, your bank account, um, what works you would register in the, in the first place, and you know, basic stuff. Not really the actual contract, but just basic stuff. And then, when, when they think you're suitable for membership, because you're a, uh, you, 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 you're a copywriter, you're a musician, you're a, what, you, know, you know the drill. If you're, if you're creative, if you actually create and you're suitable for uh, membership, then they send you um, their copy of a Berechtigungsvertrag, the authorization agreement, in which the actual music plays. Meaning in this contract, you assign all of your currently existing and future copyrights. And I'm, I'm saying Urheberrechte in, in parentheses, basically, because there is a slight difference in German Urheberrechten and English copyrights, but you sort of get the drift to them. That means, and this is crucial, whatever you have in a certain way, especially if you're a musician, everything that you have the rights to exploit in, you assign to GEMA. Meaning, you ridden yourself of all the, all the exploitation rights and hand them over to say, GEMA, please do that for me because I don't want to. This is crucial all the existing. That doesn't mean you just hand in the rights to certain tracks that you list, but everything that you own, all the rights that you own at the time and that you will own during the time, during the term of this contract. Every, and I, I'm coming to this, I'm just saying this because it's every so often, even I was in doubt because there is a certain formality that I will go to um, in a minute that makes you doubt, like, why is this all, what is this all about? You hand everything over. You ask them to exploit everything that deals with your copyrights, especially when it comes to music, like to the musicians among us. You don't get to decide anymore, at least not anymore, because you already, obviously you already did when you became a member. Then I, I often get the, the question, why don't you do it on a track-by-track -track basis, especially when we deal with demo party organizing and we, we come up with those apparently strict rules and we say, if you are a member, please don't enter in our competitions because if we, if, if we play your music, be it as good as you want, we will owe GEMA fees. We will have to pay big time. One track is enough for thousands of euros in fees that we have to pay. That's why. It's not because we don't like you. I mean, we kind of don't like you because you're a GEMA member. <laughs> but, but it has nothing to do with that in that regard. That, that's why we have to be so strict, because it'll cost us. Because the, the demo party organizers will have to for, fill out playlists, especially not, ironically, not in, you have to announce every, uh, every event in advance and say, we're going to have this event. And we're planning to play this and this and that, not concrete plan, uh, playlists, but music from, let's say, 6 p.m. to 3 a.m. in the morning. 
Um, and we want, you know, DJs, we have a live act, we have a this, we have a that. And then when you're done, you will, you, they will tell you what you have to pay. You don't even get like a concrete number in, in, in advance. You, you tell them and then if, if that's what they think, you will be given a bill basically. So, um, so sometimes people approach us and say, well, well, in my copyright or uh, association, we do it on a track by track basis, which I strongly doubt, uh, but obviously, I mean, there are tons of BIEM members and I don't know how it's done in, in, uh, in many countries, um, but it is theoretically possible that, an, that an, uh, a foreign um, collecting society does it differently meaning you become a member, but it, you don't hand all the rights over automatically, but only for the tracks that you register. Now, you also have to register your own tracks at GEMA, but it has nothing to do with the contract that you have. It's basically a formality that allows them to get a hit and to distribute the money that they collect, because that's basically what, you know, what they set out to do. They said, um, we, we, we basically collect your money and give it back to you. Now, I'm not going to talk about the whole distribution scheme because it's, I, honestly, I don't really know. Um, all, the, and what I know is basically they have certain, um, certain uh, statistics on, as to what band or group or artist basically was played, how often, and, and what kind of clubs. And so the distribution scream is a uh, scream. Uh, scheme is not really part of this this uh, talk, but you also have to register your tracks if you want royalties on it. But it has, ha regardless of that, you hand over all your tracks, uh, all the rights in your tracks to GEMA. I think GEMA doesn't allow you to do that because, first of all, GEMA structures don't allow for it. They they're not made for that. They don't care. They have a certain scheme distribution, and they don't care. They say. We're not set out to do that. We want it differently, and if you want to become a member, do that. The Facebook principle. Secondly, GEMA probably doesn't want you raisin picking, because they don't want the crap. They want the good shit, too. And, if, and what, if, you, if you're fed up, you only hand in the, the rubbish? I wouldn't want that if I was GEMA, but I think that's just a side effect. And thirdly, um, GEMA just doesn't. It just, it's not set out that way. The contract is just not that way. Really? <laughs> yeah. Really. <laughs> it's, it's that. It's, I get that question a lot, but yeah, like, oh, really? Yeah, really. It's, that's how it is. Sorry to say that. Now, then why should you register each track anyway? I already kind of said that. It has nothing to do with that. I, I saw, went over this. Yeah, but it has to do with the database hits. Like every, um, every uh, event organizer has to hand in playlists, um, especially if, if you're a, a non-GEMA protected material demo party, you have to hand in playlists, like lists of every single track that you play to prove to them that you did not, um, you did not play any of their protected material. That alone, I think, is peculiar because that's unknown in, in, in civil uh, procedures, in, at least in German law. Like when you want something and you sue, you have to provide evidence that that is the case, not the other way around. It's like, like I was, I don't know, I, I would sue my landlord and he would say, well, you have to prove stuff that, um, that benefits me. But so in, a, in a way, GEMA is sort of half official, so they have the authority to demand from you that you hand in playlists to say that you did not play anything GEMA protected? Well, actually that consists of two uh, parts. The first part, there is uh, some clause in the law saying it is believed that the track is registered with the collecting society. And the second part of the, um, the clause is that GEMA says we are the collecting society. So there are some uh, struggles to get a second uh, collecting society uh, to the start, so then GEMA will ha actually have to prove the songs are registered with them. With them, too. True. The, true. That is actually a double. I didn't even think of that. You're right. It's, um, it, it bases on two preambles, if you will, like two axioms. You say, first of all, we assume that the, track you, the tracks you play are registered, and then secondly, with them. They don't have to prove, prove either of that. You need to prove to them that you played something that was not registered with them. 
So that's kind of, that's kind of a hassle, and um, that's also how it came up that um, it's happened before that after a demo party we handed in playlists, and a member of a foreign uh, BIM association showed up who thought it was on a single track basis, and it might have been, but GEMA really doesn't care. And also, it's kind of difficult for you as a demo party organizer to prove it. It's, it's a hassle. Like, that's why we have to be stri strict and say, sorry, it's, if you're registered, please don't do this with us. <laughs> Stranger things have happened. Now, um, <clears throat> even as a creator, you yourself may not do certain things with your music. And at that point, it becomes so strange that sometimes people don't understand it. As you ridden yourself of certain rights, meaning all rights basically in your music, you may not do with your, you as the, the creator may not do with the music what you would usually be allowed to. Meaning, even if you offer it for download for free, you will, you will be obliged to pay GEMA fees for it. I think this is very strange. I think it, it, it kind of shows a very strange problem that we all have. Like at that point, most of the heads go, yeah, no. <laughs> For reason. But Frank. <laughs> but Frank, the thing is, um, I think all of this is actually pretty okay -ish for professional musicians. It, I think we are uh, a certain small part of uh, the music scene which might have a bigger problem with this sort of rules, isn't it like this? I mean, if you're a professional musician, you will say, okay, why should I offer my own music for free? Um, but it is, as a demo scener, we are in a niche where, where it's probably pretty strange, all of these rules. Well, it's, um, I would, y y in principle, yes, but sometimes it's a marketing and PR gag, like, um, uh, like no, I, I just know it from a personal experience. The new uh, Bonobo album came out. I think it's a perfect example, go, go buy it. Bonobo, the North Borders, perfect. Super to chill out. Um, and they offer one track, the Cirrus track, I think it's the third track on the album, for free because they want to hook up people to it, and uh, the video is awesome too. Um, so it's not something that just we do because we're used to nonprofit and, and non-commercial. It's, it's, they, they have to reserve budget to do this, which is, which is then probably okay too. Theor like legally, I say, well, we could always just have deviating agreements saying, well, I'm not giving you all my rights, I'm just giving you rights for offline distribution, like CDs and shit. Of course, GEMA is not gonna do that. They have, I don't know how many thousands, maybe millions of, of members, they're not gonna care. They're just gonna go, yeah, no. <laughs> so, um, so theoretically, it would be possible, of course, but GEMA doesn't move because it's become too big, too much of a hassle to, to administer. So what can you do? If you don't like what GEMA does, you have a few choices. I mean, some of them are kind of obvious. You can not become a member. You can um, do what the contract says you should do. You, if you violate it, you should make sure you're not caught. So if you, and that's also, I mean, now, honestly, bluntly speaking, if you enter an entry under a false name, please make it so good that we won't notice. Like don't, that's also why we say, don't enter it under Gema Sucks name. We cannot do that. We have to take it out, because it's so obvious we will get into trouble if we play it, even if we wanted to play it. Which we don't, but. <laughs> but if, we, you know, that, that's our problem. Just if you, don't get caught, and just make sure that we, we can believe you that you are who you are. Or, obviously, quit. <laughs> now, about quitting, that's also something peculiar. If you want to quit, you can obviously um, terminate the agreement like you can with any contract. It's not a lifetime membership and once, like a mafia thing. Once you're in, you never get out. It's not true. At the moment, the, the, uh, the GEMA membership contracts last for uh, three-year periods. So if you become a member, you have, to you have to stay a member for at least three years. 
If you don't quit, you will stay, or GEMA terminates the agreement for some reason, um, you will be a member for the following th three years as well, and so on and so on, until one of the parties um, terminates the agreement with a six months notice. So if, you, if you're really fed up, you better find the right time, because otherwise you'll be stuck for another three and a half years. Watch out, even if you declare termination of your agreement, you will be bound by the agreement until it ends. That means even for, the, even for the time between the termination of the agreement and the actual end of the agreement, everything that you create will be exploited by GEMA. That's the contract. So it's not enough to just say, I'm out, I quit. You will have to, if you want them not to play a significant role in this, you will have to wait until the three years are over. Come again. When you quit, what about the work you created before having your, mem your membership at GEMA? Until the contract ends, it will be exploited by GEMA and everything, ap and after that, the, term the contract is over. Then GEMA is out. Okay, so after the contract, you get your work back if it was before your yeah. membership. Okay. It's not like with Scene Orc. Once it's there, we never delete it. <laughs> um. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for being my lawyer and defending me for all the things I allegedly downloaded and all the traffic violations I allegedly did. I may not say what it was. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, what is if I, for example, would be a solo artist and also be in a band? So how would that work? And maybe I would be a solo artist for Gemma and in a band that is with another collecting society. How does this work? Uh, or doesn't it? it, it it does, but... Or can I have more alter egos like JCO with the Jakob Bienenhalm and so on, and that only one is in the Gemma and the other one is not? The, you know, how, how is this working? Yeah, no, no not. That's, that's why I'm saying um, it's, there are various artists that are not caught that way. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's, it's difficult. When you, when you enter a name, um, you're, you can also enter a, like an artist name or a pseudonym or something. Um, but that, as far as I know, is included as well. It has nothing to do like how you call yourself in this gig or that gig. Um, it's everything you create. Um, at least, wait, at least... Um, well, f first of all, just to clear this out, I, uh, a band cannot become a GEMA member, but its members can. So every member can become, uh, every member of the band can become a GEMA member. Which, of course, makes it kind of difficult because then you have different creators and it's, it's a collective work and it's... Uh, <laughs> is your life not complicated enough yet as it is? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, thanks to you. Uh, okay. I may still not say what it was. Um, <laughs> um, uh, about the different pseudonyms, as far as I know, it, makes, it plays no... Uh, it plays no important role what pseudonym you, um, you published it under. Is that correct? Yes? Okay. Um, I think so, yeah. Um, that, but that does, of course, not mean that uh, people don't use certain pseudonyms and are just not caught. That's why I'm saying they're, they're probably not going to perform under a name as such as Gima Sucks. Okay. Um, and this is something I have not been able to read into deeply, but I thought it might be interesting for those of you who are into digital um, distribution especially. There is apparently, I have, as again, I have not uh, studied the, the actual case, but there is theoretically a, um, a possibility to partially terminate the agreement and by that take away certain rights that GEMA has. I'm sure they're not happy about it, um, but since the termination is a one-sided declaration and not a contract. Term, every, each, each party can, can terminate. It's not a contract. By that, you can terminate a part of the contract and just give them, uh, like, keep just an offline distribution part with them and do everything else online. I have no practical experience as to how that works and how difficult your life becomes, but Abducti, you can always try it out if you want. <laughs> now, um, <clears throat> GEMA doesn't mean evil. I'm, I can honestly say, um, in the different times that I have been uh, dealing with GEMA issues for demo parties, I have not a single time had anyone on the phone at GEMA who meant evil. 
They're always very, very nice people. They want to help you find a solution. Even when it comes to like special um, uh, Härtefälle, how, how do you say that in German? Um, Edge cases. Huh? Edge cases? Edge cases? Sounds funny, but wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, a certain, I mean, certain cases that would mean um, whose consequences for the organizer would be so harsh that it would like ruin their existence or something. Um, th they're very nice people. They want to find a solution for you. And usually, at least the people that I talk to, it might be because I sort of tell them I'm an attorney right up front and I get connected to certain people or something. Um, but they always want to find a solution and, and specifically tell me, OK, if, if you do this and this and that, we can sort of take that uh, schedule and go to this and how much entry fee do you have and are there any extras included and stuff. Um, it's been interesting, especially for revision this time. Hmm? Hardship case? Hardship case. Hardship case. I like that. Hardship case is cooler, isn't it? Edge case. Edge case for you? With fries? Okay. Okay. But Gimma doesn't mean evil. Um, it's kind of forced to, to do evil, like Gollum, in a way. How do I know? Because there is a, a very strange uh, law that you might have heard of, and probably not. Um, Mo man, many Germans have heard of the Urhebergesetz, the Copyright Act, basically. But there is another act that's kind of similar. It has this, these strange letters in it, Wahrnehmungs, Urheberwahrnehmungsgesetz. It's a law that basically uh, deals with GEMA issues and collecting societies and how copyrights have to be exploited. And also that if you, um, it also states stuff like if you become a GEMA member, um, you, um, GEMA is obliged to exploit the rights. They don't just have the right, they have the duty to do it. So it's not like just a lazy agent. They actually have to, well, it might be, but they're not, they're not allowed to. <clears throat> Some things become interesting, and I'm now widening the horizon a little bit to online streaming services and like go a little bit beyond demo party uh, organizing because some, some aspects are repetitive and come with every demo party. And sometimes um, a few things are much more, um, more concrete to see when you go a little bit beyond that. First of all, collecting societies such as GEMA have an obligation to grant you a license. If you start an online streaming service or a download portal or an anything and you want a license, you will be given one. They have to. They have to give you a license. Some people say it's because they have the monopoly, and it, it might be because of that, but they, the law says they have to give you a license. It doesn't mean it has to be feasible or lucrative for you, but it says, um, well, first of all, it has to be comparable. And I think this is, this comparison is, I think, the core problem of basically all the GEMA problems that we have today. Because they're stuck. They're stuck. That's why I'm saying they're not meaning to do evil. They're forced to. Because they, they concluded, they granted licenses. They started with one license, and then they granted another. And at the time when you had no internet um, for porn, uh, you had CDs and you, or uh, uh, music cassettes or LPs and stuff like that. You could, you could easily calculate like how many license, like how many uh, pieces do we have to produce? Have, do we have to go get into distribution channels in the shops and the this and the that? And you could say, well, your target group is about this big and you will sell that many pieces. So, so you could tell where it would end up in a way. You could, it was basically a sell, sales calculation. And then, distribution channels evolved and developed. And you had internet for various things. Um, Four. Thank you. Um, various things, um, and amongst which, as, as bandwidth became bigger and bigger and cheaper, uh, music. And then what, what do you do? Like when somebody comes up to you and you, you, you've only had offline media, you've had CDs, let's say just CDs, let's keep the old stuff like vinyl and stuff. Uh, let's say you've ha only had CDs, and now the internet comes along, and somebody comes to you and says, I have a really cool idea. I want uh, an online music streaming service. Well, you have to grant them a license, and it has to be comparable. But how do you compare? That's, you have no experience as to 
um, what the usage will be, how many downloads will you have, how many streaming pieces will you have. So how do you compare stuff like that? I think that's one of the core problems that we have with GEMA issues today. Um, so I don't know about here, but in Berlin at least, maybe in all of Germany, there has been this uh, big thing about clubs that have open all night playing music, suddenly having to pay huge licenses for the music and forcing them to shut down because of that. Yes. Uh, is this because of this comparable conditions thing and how they compare to, for example, a radio um, station? Or on, honestly, I don't know how much contributes to that. Um, it's um, the, the, you're t probably talking about the, the revolution of all the GEMA uh, schedules that they have, the tarife, and which is now like I've I've heard uh, examples from four or five times as, as expensive. Just an hour ago, somebody told me it was ten times as expensive as before. Um, so um, I think that has, that has not much to do with comparab comparability because that stuff, the clubs, you had before. It's not something you never had. Um, but it is certainly part of the whole uh, like cocooning um, development that GEMA is, is going through these days um, as they're trying to adapt to the the whole like pieces in streaming and different schedules and how do you deal with that? It is certainly part of it, but I, I'm not quite sure it's because of the comparability, but just because they have to grant fair licenses um, and they're trying to adapt. It's, I'm sure this is not because, um, because people are evil at GEMA and they, they just want their precious. Um, it's just because they, they need to adapt to, 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 the, to the new times or something. But, um, I've, I've, I have seen certain calculations. I have no idea how they come up with prices like that. Also, in that case, I think they, don't, they didn't mean evil. I think in some cases they just had no idea what it would mean. But it, it may be the decision makers. I'm sure the people that you, you could call and ask for a schedule would know. Because they do that every day. But sometimes the decision makers, I, I, I don't really know. I can only suggest. And part of it might also, there's, okay. Internet streams, or do they apply to the same rules there? Uh, no, there are differences. Um, there are different. There are tons of schedules. Um, <laughs> we will. And <laughs> are you playing Quake? <laughs> um, um, uh, but um, no, there are there are uh, schedules for radio station, like classic, like offline radio stations and uh, internet streaming. Um, Providers, but we'll also come to that I'll, because I, there are three schedules that sort of sound the same, and I just wanted to make sure that there are different different uh, schedules for it. And secondly, um, before we go into any specific uh, schedule, um, there is another um, law in this Urheberwahrnehmungsgesetz uh, that says the calculation basis for the schedules shall, in principle, and that is a problem because in print, what, what is it, what is in principle? Like, that means we do what we want unless we don't want to, or something. Be the profit achieved through the use. And that, I think, is both very nice to do and a clever thing to do, and one of the stupidest things you could do. Because that goes both ways. I mean, in theory, it's good to say, well, if you make more money, we want more royalties. Because, you know, you make more money, you're, you're doing well, we want to do well. But um, it's, it's a practical problem. How do you measure what profit an online streaming service makes? But that's only a side problem. Also, what's profit? Like, the, you, you take your sales and you subtract your costs and that's it? I mean, is, is that it? Or do you calculate a certain role or importance for the people? Profit. It opens a lot of doors for arguments, but um, in principle, like calculate according to profit. Mm -hmm. So it's kind. Of, it's very difficult. And also sometimes, especially when it comes to new media, how do you know the profit? You have to grant them a license that is sort of calculated by the what profit. If you have no profit yet, if you do, if you do something that's never been done before, how do you know the profit? So you have to estimate in a way. Uh, what yep. about? 
Uh, what about non-profit online radios? No, non-profit online radios. So we have no profit. We pay nothing, or <laughs> I, how, how does it? Don't, I don't. I don't. Non-profit online radios. Non-profit. Online radios. Yes. Online. They make radio. no profit, so they pay nothing. Uh, they may. They may make a profit, but if it's ad funded, we will come to that. There is a specific schedule for that. As there are, by the way, um, very interesting um, plans and, and tariffs for you if you uh, create an event. And one of the things that I tried to, um, to talk Defox into was that, we, that revision was a zoo. And he said, well, we have monkeys, we have elephants, we have... <laughs> yeah, that didn't work, but um, I, I like the idea. Um, now, um, <clears throat> I want to go into a few GEMA plans just to give you an idea what we face with when, you, uh, when we organize a demo party, um, when we do uh, an online streaming service um, for event organizers. Um, usually what you do is you are in a schedule that's called MU, like Unterhaltungsmusik. Uh, and this is, um, this is the main schedule that will change and that will affect most of the, of the club owners. Because it'll be valid until the end of this year, um, and then it will change. And it, um, it basically builds it, um, invoices of, of, um, upon size of the event and upon entry fee. And just to give you an idea what we did in order to keep the fees at, an, at a toler tolerable level. First of all, we, uh, we minimize the size of the event, meaning we said, well, they, they, they usually have uh, maps of all, the, all the, the event halls. So they have a map of, of EVAC, so they know exactly how big it is. So you can't tell them lies. But you can tell them, well, the area that's um, on the main plan that's uh, described as Bühne, like stage, which we use as a sleeping area, is a sleeping area. So nobody goes there to dance. They go there to sleep. And, and if, we play, if, they, if we have DJs playing on the stage, everybody behind there will be annoyed the hell out of. So we subtracted that. And it's, as far as I could tell, they're going to do that. Then we said, everything in the entrance area with the, 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 those, those black curtains uh, barred off is not really a place you go to to dance. It's kind of not as noisy, and people go there to socialize, so we subtracted that too, and I think we'll go through with this. But what we could not do is, and it's very strange, they have sometimes table row calculations and stuff like that. Um, they said, but we could not get around, and then we subtracted basically the stage on which the DJ will play, but nobody is about allowed to go to, um, and certain like the gallery and stuff like, and, and the beam team area and stuff like that. So we ended up um, with, I think it was 1,300, 1,250 square meters, um, because the table rows count. Because I could not tell them convincingly that everybody at the table rows is annoyed by the music played on the main stage. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it would also have been a lie. Like nobody if, on yeah, nobody dances on the tables, but that doesn't, it's not a requirement, I think. But, um, but to give you an idea, um, it, we, the, the organizers spent a lot of money on having the DJs play on the main stage because if we had only had them play on the second stage, that part of area would have been remarkably smaller and the fees would have been extremely much lower. So it's a luxury that we have them play on the, on the main stage. And with the entry fee, what happened actually is um, as the event is, lasts for three days, we took the 60 euros entry fee. It was 60 this year, right? Okay. We took the 60 and we divided them by three because we have three nights, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then we said, well, well, no, no it's actually mathematically it's a step before that. We, we said, well, in this entry fee, it's not only the music, they get a free seat and internet guarantee and they can contribute it, they can participate in all the competitions and they get a welcome package and free coffee. So we put basically everything in it that you get for free to subtract the amount from the entrance fee. 
So we ended up, after all, in our calculation with 33 euros that basically go to only music, which I think is a kind of strange because you don't get, you don't come here for the DJs, you come here also for the DJs, but not entirely. Hoffmann. Hoffmann, yeah. <laughs> um, so we took the 33 and we divided them by three, which, and which um, so, so we ended up with uh, 11 euros per night, and that's the fee that we took to calculate the fees. Uh, I was told this is not possible to divide the entrance fee. But that's what we did. Still? <laughs> no, no, no. For you. <laughs> stop. <laughs> Full stop. They even told us you have to multiply the entrance fee for each day. Yes. <laughs> that's what they told us. Um, Whose day? Gamer. Like after I was done with them? <laughs> No, uh, in a different uh, speech I had with them, a telephone ah. call. Um, and they told us, well, you actually have to uh, Multiply pay it. three times for each day 30 euro. So it's 90 euro. So they calculated with 90 euros, although the, the visitors yeah. at Evoke only paid 30? Yeah, uh, strange stuff going on there. The, uh, no. Yeah, yeah, I okay. Was, okay. We What? didn't want to pay anything, so in okay. the end it worked out, so but... It worked out? Good, yeah, yeah. okay. Well, that's strange. Okay, but no, but it would not be multiplied by all means. I mean, you, they would calculate on a basis you didn't pay. That's very strange. Okay. And then for live, but this, this is only, um, like for the MU is only for like uh, played music, uh, re replayed music, playback music, not live music. Um, and also, it makes a difference whether you play only uh, like classic media, LP, CDs, or MP3s. MP3s, ironically, are much more expensive. The plan is much more expensive because they say, well, copying and everything, the multiplication is much more expensive. It actually is. It makes a it makes a substantial um, um, it makes a substantial difference. So, in a way, Knuki will be cheaper than Hoffman, <laughs> which is. Strange in a way, because you know we all don't, because they don't charge us for it. But it's, it's because because Knuki doesn't play any MP3s, but only vinyl. It's cheaper for us. Very strange. Now VR is oh 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 yes question. Yeah, I have a question about the MP3s. Why is it more expensive? Normally the DJ has to pay for that. The, the question is why yeah. it is. Yeah, in Belgium we uh, DJs have to pay for a license to play music from copies sources like CDRs or laptops or anything? Uh, that... Because as an event organizer, you cannot tell on beforehand if the DJ will play from CD, vinyl, MP3, so, whatever. So in Belgium, you would not have to pay fees when the DJ has already done it, or you pay double? Uh, no, in Belgium, the DJ, when he plays, for, uh, plays from copies like CDRs, or he digitalized everything onto his hard drive, he has to pay a yearly fee. Uh, well, until last year, because this year they don't have to pay it anymore. Uh, so I don't understand why uh, an organizer should know what, a DJ is, uh, what medium uh, a DJ is playing. Um, I, I'm, I think I didn't understand the last part. Uh, the question I, is... Yeah. So an organizer normally doesn't know what medium a uh, DJ will use. Unless he asks. <laughs> It's yeah, of course. But as an organizer, normally you just provide the equipment and the DJ comes along and it's either vinyl or just connect his laptop to the, to the uh, mixer. It, true. It's if if the question is how I mean, the the this is how the fees are calculated. What? You have to provide a track list. You can even ask him. Yeah, yeah. What kind of medium were you playing from? You you have to ask him in a way. It's, it makes a difference. It makes a difference whether he plays just ready-made soul but, pieces or. Yeah, but the the DJ he either pays for the LP or the CD or the MP3 as well. Yes. So he always pays. So there is the, the DJ has paid for the music. Yes. 
it doesn't matter if it's MP3 or physical uh, carrier. Right, that's a, I think we're talking, uh, yeah, I think we're talking different rights here. I guess um, we agree this is stupid, but that's the way it is. Okay. And starting actually I, from April, I, Germany DJs have to pay for... The, 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 I, I think, um, pr um, the, 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 what I heard was, was uh, the, the, the feedback was it's stupid and we should acknowledge it. Um, I think, well, what I thought is um, it would come a, a by, by April, but she said that this schedule would be valid until, what, what kind of ter schedule are you talking about that's going to uh, be? There's a ah. Starting on April 1st, there's a BRE schedule, so additionally to the club as a ah. DJ, you have to pay 13 cents per track per ah, year that they, you own per they copy. double. Yeah. Every year, 13, 13 cent per track, owning 300,000 tracks, you quit DJing. Ah, okay. Uh, that's uh, new to me. I did not know that. So we're actually going to start double, yeah. uh, double invoicing. Nice. Uh, I think in Switzerland it's actually similar. I have a friend who's a DJ, and she also has to pay some kind of fee to Suiza. I'm not sure if the club pays as well, though. Um, double, yeah, it's, I, I mean, what we're kind of used to, I'm not sure if you've heard this, but we pay, in a way, certain fees by buying certain media already, like CD burners, and it, it, it's kind of old. Um, a couple of years back, we would talk about uh, certain fees that you would pay automatically when you buy a blank CD or a printer or a, a hard drive, anything that could theoretically be used to copy stuff. Um, so that you pay, but you also on top pay for the event where you charge uh, visitors to, to enter the event and be part of this and enjoy the music. It's, I know. It's, uh, I think it's also a desperate attempt to, to sort of get it from the people who still have money. Because in the media, you, they sort of, I mean, you can t sort of tell a lot of clubs will be closing because they just cannot afford to stay open legally. It's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a shame, I think. Um, now, for online streaming service providers, um, there is a, a, a schedule called VROD. And I'll go into three. Um, uh, we have, oh, we have nine minutes. Great. Um, I'll go into three of the schedules in a minute. Um, just a word on, on YouTube and, and Spotify and all sorts of the, the online streaming services. Because Spotify is, is very known. I mean, I'm sure all, all of you know about it. And you might have thought, how does Spotify do it? I mean, how can they stay open? How can they do that? Now, first, YouTube and GEMA had a, rem had a remuneration agreement until 2009. It expired, and ever since, they've been fighting. And that's kind of when, like in 2010, I think it was, when, uh, when we started seeing those nice um, images that you saw at the very beginning. They also have a very strange legal separation of debtor and interfere. Because YouTube doesn't have any own content. It's not like YouTube uploads anything. YouTube is just a platform provider. It's a third content provider, just like mm, Facebook in many cases. Like, or what? <laughs> Pirate Bay. Perfect example. It's, it's true in a way. Um, they don't upload stuff themselves. They have other people do it. And in, according to German law, it means if you don't know of a rights violation, you don't have to do shit. <laughs> in, that, in, in, in YouTube's case, that's not even true entirely anymore. But um, no, so we have a very strange separation. YouTube doesn't upload anything, but just imagine GEMA approaching every, each and every YouTube user saying, you uploaded this and that, we want fees from you. And I'm kind of sure they understood it's not happening, so they approach YouTube. So of course Google says, well, yeah, okay, but not that much. So ever since, um, like for two, three years, they've been fighting about how much a single video um, opening should cost. And um, last year, there was a court decision. I'm not sure who, who, who's heard of this, like uh, gaming YouTube? OK. Um, 
Gema sued YouTube to delete certain videos, which YouTube just didn't want to. They said, we don't know about it, we don't care. I mean, it's a very, very like, rough summary of it. And the district court, Landgericht uh, Hamburg, um, said, all right, it's it, a partial, it was a partial success. And as YouTube is a third, content, a third party pro, content provider, they basically don't have to do anything unless they know. So they said, well, OK, in this case, in that case, but not like proactively. But the decision in that case included an obligation by, like, uh, towards YouTube to have a word filter, to be sort of proactive instead of looking back and saying, well, OK, if that's illegal, we're going to delete it. Which is very strange, which is a reversal of how it usually is in, in German copyright law. Just to give you an idea, these are the songs that um, were fought about. You might, well, you might not know many of those people, but it's, yeah. Gilligan, you like no, no none. Sex, sex on a bar. Yeah, Club Bizarre. Club Bizarre kennt man, oder? Lieder, die wie Brücken sind. Rolf Zukowski, please. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. Now GEMA has initiated arbitration, also Schiedsgerichtsbarkeit. There is a Schiedsstelle, an arbitrator, that is now, um, has now been called upon by GEMA to, to see what they can do. GEMA doesn't seem to want to fight, but they seem to want to get like, fair licenses. And of course, I mean, in a way, you, kind of, you can kind of tell YouTube and Google has the money to pay. They just don't want to. And it's, I, can, I can sort of understand, if you were Google and you, you provided a third-party content platform, you would go, I don't do that. I don't do anything. I just have a platform. If people upload something, why should I pay? At least, at, especially that much. It's difficult to say how the outcome will be, but let's just hope um, we're going to see videos again real soon. Um, uh, yeah, um, uh, YouTube should, in gamers view, pay for uh, every uh, view a video has. Uh, does this only concern German views, or uh, is it worldwide? Um, for every work that GEMA has rights in. Okay, so, so it's, it's worldwide. If someone outside of Germany watches the video, YouTube should pay GEMA. That's and what I think, yeah. Because just imagine you had, um, you had the rights in it. No? Yeah. You had the rights in it. Um, and you would earn um, worldwide. It doesn't matter if it's a Tokyo concert or Hamburg concert. I, yeah, that's what I think. Which, of course, makes it a very strange risk. Because you never know what's going to happen. We're almost out of time. Yeah. I just oh, yeah. want, uh, because I, I know that uh, GEMA does, uh, for, for Tono, which is the Norwegian uh, origin, uh, or kind of the Norwegian uh, member, uh, member or, or, yeah, like a, a similar concept, G uh, GEMA does enforce rights inside Germany for Norwegian, for Tono uh, works. Yeah, it's a partnership, yes. But how can they th at the same time uh, claim uh, copyrights from other countries. That it, sounds like a very uh, <laughs> poorly it, it's, cited contract. It, or I, I don't think they're going to approach every, um, every, every, like the same company in every country. Um, in that case, in like the YouTube case, they, were, they will uh, approach the German subsidiary of, of YouTube and basically invoice or argue with them. I'm not quite sure if that answers your question. No, no, no. I meant that for, like, for Norwegian artists, whenever they're played in Germany, they will be, you know, their GEMA will collect uh, royalties for that. Yes, but Whereas, not for its own builds. I mean, it's not, it's not going to do that for itself, but it's going to basically route it through to Tono. That might be, be true, but uh, will they still kind of collect? I, I don't understand. Kind of like, if they would is that a beer topic? <laughs> Can we talk? Might be. Now, can, can we talk about this when we're done? Yeah. Last question. Um, 
Um, what I'm always wondering about is why there's so much heavy between Gema and YouTube or Google. What about other video platforms like uh, My Video and Clipfish? Well, I don't really, um, um, I'm not really into that, um, into really uh, into them that much. But be a topic. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, also uh, first of all, it's basically just not as important. They want to fight this through with the big with the big fish and then sort of. Is it fast? Yeah. I only have like two more things, so. No? <coughs> nee. Okay. No, 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 no. Okay. No more questions. <laughs> Fuck you. I'll, I'll be here. I'll be here. Even if you argue with Gema, you can still start your streaming service. I told you, you have to be granted a license, you can start. But economically, you have to build reserves. So, especially for the amount in dispute. Meaning, if, for example, Gema wants. Uh, 0 0.375 cent per streamed video, and you want you say, well, I'm going to pay you 0 0.2 cent. The difference you have to put in reserves. You can start some, but many services have started like that, but they need to keep that in reserves because one one day they might be obliged to pot, to pay, and you have to do that. And just important to know because sometimes when you have a argue like an argument going on for two years. And you, you can see like millions and millions of, of clicks. You go, ooh, that must be quite some reserve that you have there. Quickly, the three VOD schedules um, to give you an idea, because they're all kind of about online demand stuff. Seven, like v VROD seven, is used for downloads of single songs or albums, like one time stuff. And limited subscriptions, if you have like a 10 song subscription per month or something, that is your schedule. Eight is used for paid limitless streaming. So if you, if you have a, a paid Spotify account, flat fee plans, or plans. And nine is used for the ad funded streaming services. So if you have a, 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 a free, like a standard account with Spotify, it is a different plan. So that's how certain um, service providers can offer you uh, free plans at different rates towards Gema. So you can tell they're moving into the right direction. And music on demand, that stuff too. Thank you. <laughs> One hour straight. Thank you all. See you over a beer outside. <laughs>